So I couldn't sleep anymore, and uh, I figured I would do something uh, for you all, and for myself, actually, and follow through on making a new video. Look at this, dudes. Presented to Kevin G. Schmidt for passing 100,000 subscribers. All jokes aside, it's pretty darn cool. I think about how far YouTube has come since I probably uploaded my first video. But really, we have one of them too. And it just reminds me how um, powerful of a tool it is to connect, to share, and for me lately, to learn. Enough about me. So in honor of my birthday, Happy birthday to you. I got a chance to sit down with an old friend and a friend I knew about to talk about life as a child actor. You may know my buddy Chris from one of my favorite movies, Just Friends, and AJ from Even Stevens. We got a chance to talk about our experiences growing up as child actors, some of the challenges we faced, and ultimately a unique education that prepared us for the rest of our adult lives. So sit back, relax, enjoy the chat, and uh, more videos coming to you soon. All right, Mr. Kevin Schmidt, thanks for coming on the Coogan Chronicles today. How you doing, man? I'm well. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks we for just being talked here. right before. Yeah, we just talked right before this. I know you, AJ, and you did not ever meet. We knew Although each other. I just want to. I just want to throw a couple of things out there. We've never met Kevin in person, but we both did episodes of Oliver Bean. We both mm -hmm. did episodes of Numbers. We both did episodes of CSI. Uh, we both did episodes of. <laughs> I mean, we hit all the bases, you know. But we never, yeah. uh, we never. So you guys share people. dressing rooms without realizing it. No Countless doubt. times. Yeah. No yeah. doubt. One Probably wore each other's wardrobe fitting. One coming exactly. right out. Yeah. yeah, yeah, totally. There we go. Probably the same set tutors. Probably literally. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. sat in the same same tutor rooms in the same seat, uh, doing similar homework. It's interesting. How do you, how do you I and Kevin know each other, Chris. Well, he, th this is what I was going to bring, which is so fascinating. So Kevin has two brothers. Where do you fit in the in the pack? In the middle. Order? You're the middle. Uh -huh. Okay, so I'm the oldest. So uh, Kevin's two brothers. All three of you are actors as well, right? Yeah. And so were me and my brothers. And so we knew the Schmidt family because if there was ever on the rare occasion that they needed like three brother actors, you know, if there was some commercial like we need three brother actors or there was a movie where they were like, we need uh, to age the kid, you know, slowly. So if you got a brother, it looks just like it. it's great. Uh, any type of these scenarios, which <laughs> they were rare, but uh, you know, over the course of a few years, there's quite a lot. Um, we, I, we would always see the Schmitz or we would hear about the Schmitz. And, and it was a, when you walk into a room and you suddenly feel like you're like in a parallel universe, looking at yourself in the mirror, that always felt like that to me with, with the Schmitz because it was three boys were all the, around the same age. We had our mom there, our dad there, and we're all uh, chilling in a waiting room to audition mm -hmm. together. Um, mm -hmm. And you didn't often see three boys signed up for for acting together. It's a rare, I wonder what the, today I thought maybe we'll find out like what that kernel of truth is that's similar in our families that made that happen. You know, maybe there's something there that defined that that route for each of us. That's exactly I was I was the reluctant one. So were you the middle one yeah. always is that's yeah. always the uh, that was my brother too. He um, mm -hmm. yeah, he he loved getting on the set. Uh, so he can get out of school. That was his big he was like, once he got there, he was like, I got to work. <laughs> yeah, that was his thing. Yeah. 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 How did you so so to start us off? That's how we know each other. The Wait, origin. It, yeah, the origin story. What What's the in like four or five sentences or less? Like, how did your <sighs> How did the, the whole family come to be a, a showbiz fan? Okay, uh, let's see, condense this. Uh, we're all from Wichita, Kansas. So it's Southeast Kansas. Um, it's actually the largest city in Kansas. Um, Wichita, my mom was born in Martinez outside San Francisco. So she knew about the entertainment industry in Hollywood, but had no direct connection. When we were super, super little, um, my oldest brother, Kenneth, um, was the performer. And even, you know, he's a lawyer these days. He's still very animated uh, and, and kind of is always looking for an opportunity to to play a character, especially around Halloween. He'll make his own his own like costumes and create his own voice. And he's just silly in that way. So 
uh, he wanted to be in in movies and television shows. And the way that he did it as a kid was we'd watch all of our favorite movies growing up and Kenneth would go up on the mantle on the fireplace and recreate every scene from every movie he loved. Um, and he was like, mom, I want to do this. I want to, I want to be in there in the TV. Um, at the time he's like five years old. My mom's like, well, we're in Kansas, honey. That's, yeah, that's not going to yeah. happen. Um, so she was a little more creative and resourceful about trying to find ways to help him see if this is something of interest, really. Um, he wound up doing like, uh, talent competitions and like, uh, spring catalog for the local mall type thing, uh, walking oh, up and down familiar. the runway. Very exactly. Uh, that wound up in a baby pageant, which he placed in out in Century City in California when he was really young. We met an agent there. It was Gold Marshak at the time. Oh, yeah. Um, old school. Oh, God. Uh, that, name, that, like me. that name exactly. sends shivers up my spine. Oh, no, that, no. Geez, I forgot so this, about that this name. This is Gold Marshak days. Um, the, uh, they, had, they, were, they were East Coast, West Coast. They were mainly East Coast. So we started going out to New York City when we were in grade school for summer. And it was three boys and we were all blonde, white head or white haired kids in Manhattan stuck out like a sore thumb. So we did our print modeling work there. Uh, Gold Marshak led to West Coast representation. Why don't you come out to California for a summer instead of New York? We went out to California and we didn't leave. And then they trapped you and then they, they, put, you, they put you in they child actor jail. Like you're here, you're going to have a headshot every three months for the exactly. rest of your lives. That's exactly. it. You're like how many remember- decades? <laughs> yeah, I can remember those gold Marshak offices. And uh, I remember sitting, I think it was Bonnie Likey's desk. I was like sitting at her desk and she goes, you know, I discovered Leonardo DiCaprio. I'm probably oh, yeah, 12 yeah. years old. And I just like almost <laughs> shit my pants right there yeah. in her office. Like, like, what? That you did what? <laughs> Leo was sat very, here. It was very <laughs> impressive. Dope. That is very. So that was it from Midwest to East Coast to West Coast. And um, I, like I said, I was the reluctant one. I moved out full time when I was 10. Um, I fell asleep in a casting office at my brother's audition. Um, it was for a little boy, uh, role in this VHS film called mind rage with Tippi Hendren. Um, the kid oh, needed yeah, to be like, kind of like, uh, internalized a little, like, um, kind of catatonic So when I woke up from my nap in the casting <laughs> office, they're like, Hey, you're next. And I'm like, I'm not here for this. And they're like, well, you should just try it. You know, you should try. I went in and I booked it and. And uh, that was my because first. of the nap because you were half awake. Yeah, and, and you know what? Like, wow, this kid's super catatonic. He's yeah. really good at Be, this. Light, I dedicated the rest of my life to a decision I made after a nap at ten. <laughs> <Truly>. <laughs> right after a nap at ten, for someone who's sort of like, you know, kid, you're coming in. I was like, I'm not, and they just forced you in and. <laughs> Life changed. I've been napping ever since. Let's be real. Yeah, I, yeah, I love exactly. I love naps. I'm known for my naps. Um, so yeah, it was it was a what I what I think caught me about it though is so I booked this randomly, like total happenstance how it all happened, but the the scene itself that hooked me, I had a revolver um in this movie that I found in my mom's desk drawer and she was mean That'd to be... our next door neighbor who was this little girl, like my girlfriend. And she was like a drunk and, 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 and angry. And I go into her bedroom with this loaded gun and I shoot my mom in this scene. And, and that's she what hooked squid- you? And you were like, yes, I'm, well, in. I'm an actor it was, for life. It was, what it, does it that was say squibs, about your- right? She had like, squibs, that- right? Yeah. Fake blood, explosions, and she collapses on the bed. The director says, cut. And I'm six, seven, eight years old at the time. Like, what is going on? Cut. The mom gets up and she goes to the director how was it look good cool she's like i'm gonna go get a bagel i'll be back and i'm just like <laughs> okay this so real? This, yeah, yeah this begs a question this basic question as you look at it is there something i mean i feel like if i'm listening to this i know nothing about kid actors I, if i just know any kid or not i'm thinking that is really fucked up that's super traumatic to do to a six or seven year old to shoot not just shoot a gun but shoot yeah. a gun at somebody and not just shoot at somebody but shoot at your mother and not just shoot them but kill them dead yeah. like there's yeah. so many layers yeah. to to well, there's blood shooting some out of form there's of squibs, yeah there's I mean. squibs and then you said that's the moment you got hooked and now is totally. that because you were a kid who does this and you just the thrill of it that's all it was to you. There was nothing super traumatic about that experience. There was no emotional no. sort of. No. no, I, I, I like, so you weren't 
suddenly child, picturing no, shooting your child, mom at 12 or anything never, and being like, never, Why never. Am I my, like I, so being a Kansas kid, like I grew up hunting, right? So I, I grew up, you know, hunting pheasant and quail and stuff like that with my dad and, and like guns weren't foreign to me, even at a young age, we were always taught to be very safe and careful. Uh, we hunter sa- hunter safety like at four or five years old. So I was you guys driving. are Wichita Cowboys. You guys yeah, are all we, good. You're we, like, we just were, put a gun in my hand. I'm seven. I don't care. I'll go do yeah, my history lesson in yeah, a moment. It, it was more the I think on for what hooked me was one something that was so emotionally intense in the in the moment, but I knew wasn't real. But even in that moment, I was shaking and my adrenaline was going. And to be able to to, to recreate moments to where you aren't really acting, it almost becomes real for you. It was, it was a high. I mean, it really was. And even flash forward now, like I'm not doing uh, as much acting as I used to. It's what I miss the most is being in the scene with somebody and so connected to where you forget that you're performing. It you sounds just, like the perfect setup, though, for full traumatization of a child. <laughs> like, it, it's, I'm shaking, my adrenaline, my mother's yeah. standing there in front of me, it all feels so real, I black out, I don't even know what's going on, I raise the gun, I shoot her, real blood spurts out, she collapses on the bed, there's a long moment of silence, the director yells cut, and the actress like, I'm gonna get a bagel, and you're just left standing there being like, I guess I'll get a bagel too and go back. Exactly. To <laughs> exactly. I fell in love with craft service right then too. Yeah, that's you know? it. You're like, that's why I'm I was such a big a boy. That's why I got to be such a big exactly. boy right there. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah. So you have speaking of that, a cheap by doesn't speak. You you have we looked you're like you 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 were one of those child actors. You never stopped working. It seems. And yeah, I just looked at your everything. resume going into this. Yeah. I'm like, this is insane. The number. Yeah, of you just never that. stopped. Like like I got to imagine for anyone. You know, I imagine most people would be familiar with at least a handful of things, if not tons of your work, but also um, probably have no idea then what that would mean to do that much work. Like I got I got to imagine you you it's 90 percent work, 10 percent school and extracurricular life. If you you having worked and auditioned that much, is that probably a good a good uh, a good percentage balance, you think? Uh, uh, 90% work, 10% school. I, I was so ready to, to get my, uh, proficiency at 16 years old. I couldn't wait, you know, like being on set since you were nine years old, working with adults your whole life and happening to go to kid jail for school three hours plus a day, um, was just so, I felt like the skills I was learning on set and the people and the conversations were so much more impactful to my life than, any day inside of a a school trailer on set. You know, being around you now reminds me of the interactions, albeit fairly limited. I think we did have some parties, some birthdays. There there, there was some outside of audition hangs and stuff. I don't remember us working together on a set in particular, but I I do remember the same circle in Oakwood apartments, Mm -hmm. that kind of thing. But I do remember all the time, I always got these same birthdays. You have almost the exact same vibe now that you did when you were young. You were very, (laughs) like, you were very, poised you're very intelligent you were very engaged with around but in a quiet way like you you know you're a very thoughtful guy and but you also had like this as i remember now i remember like the big big mop haircut you Mm -hmm. you you had that was the style of the day but like there was an intense like you you were okay with all the adults you seem to be one of them i remember always thinking like you you in particular maybe it's you and your younger brother but like all, all all you guys seem very adept at at that at sitting around the lunch table with all the adults and being like oh yeah no no i yeah no i've been to boise boise's nice yeah it's a cool place (laughs) and just like and just shooting the shit a bit and uh and you it it, it, it's no surprise then that you say you enjoyed it that 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 facet of it was meant a lot to you totally yeah yeah i mean the uh the environment of a set and, and I mean, even how sets have changed over the years, like some of these old tent pole studio features, 40, $60 million, $100 million budget, you know, we're making stuff now with, with 4k iPhones, you know, like so much has changed in the industry. Um, but the, the talented people on, in every aspect, in every department, whether it's a costume designer or cinematographer, or even as I got deeper into like post-production directing side, like meeting editors and, and um, sound designers and like everyone's just play such an important part in telling a great story. Um, that's what I loved the most was the collaborative process of, of storytelling for sure. And yeah, it's you carried definitely... through my entire life. 
I bet. I mean, that's not for, that doesn't happen for everybody. Everybody doesn't sort of suddenly carve out the curiosity as to how this whole picture comes together. I mean, actors more often than not just sort of stay in their lane, you know, and just like, okay, I'm an audition. I'm memorizing these things. I'm a very emotional person, but yeah, mm -hmm. it may, it makes sense to me that you uh, gravitated towards that and, uh, and had a mind for it. Cause you, you were as what, from what I remember, you were like that, like, you know, as a kid, you, you felt like that. You felt, um, you know, I don't know. I saw all kinds of kids that were like fucking around and just were there barely hanging on to what was supposed to happen. And were just playing, you know, I saw some other kids who were collapsing in themselves, scared as to what was going on, very disconnected. You know, I saw kids that were just there professionally. You seem to be, uh, really part of the group and really ingrained, you know, was there, did that just happen naturally or is it just because you were on so many sets doing so many things? Um, I, I almost knew before a you know, motorcycle came. Right now. Um, I, I knew right away that I was most passionate about directing. Um, so acting was always a pathway into directing. I think the best part about directing is you get to work with every single department and help encourage their best. Um, I didn't get from actor to director though. I, when I was 16, uh, I was out in Toronto filming cheaper Two, and, uh, Bonnie Hunt's been a huge mentor in my life and, and probably one of the most interesting and accomplished artists. She was an RN before she was an artist, second city in Chicago. She wrote, produced and started in her first sitcom, like in the nineties, like one of the first women to do that. So she gave me my first writing book when I was 16. And, and what my, what the writing book helped me see was structure. And prior to understanding the structure of a story, it was just a, a familiarity from reading great content and being uh, fortunate to participate in so many great stories. But once I saw the structure of telling a story, a three act structure and turning points and, and the beats you need to hit to keep an audience going from conversation to conversation, it, it, it opened up the, the, my mind to, to really the importance of every facet of the beast when telling a story. So for me, it was always, um, the highly collaborative nature of it. You need actors who are hyper focused in on on that tunnel vision of their character and the nuance and surprising you as a writer or director with your performance. You need dedicated actors. You don't want a bunch of guys like me on a set always being like, "Hey, have you thought of that?" You know, like it's it's a it's terrible, right? Yeah. You you really need. Were you were do you mind me asking? Were you like that as a kid? Did you did, did did you take it upon? Was that just sort of your thought process, or did you actually enact that? Were you on sets being like, "Excuse me, Steve Martin." Mm -hmm. Maybe you want to try the scene like, was there ever, did you really inject that collaborative spirit? Uh, I tried to be really careful. Um, you know, uh, I, as you'd think in a, in a business of performers where you're on camera and, and you need to be bold that everyone would have pretty thick skin, but that's really not the case. And even on, no, you know, some really bunch. big productions, right. Directors and producers, like you say one thing that, that questions their, vision or their authority and they can make your life a living hell. Um, I, I can hear hear your very thoughtful approach to your everything you're doing on set in your career. And I'm wondering, were you and your parents making very specific decisions about your career as a young person? Or did it all in take in, in that measured thoughtful approach? Or was it all just happening and you're just going from job to job to job and taking whatever would come up? Uh, there was, I definitely said no a few times for sure. Um, my, my, so my mom was out there full time with us, um, from age nine to, uh, she, we had a little farm in Kansas. She ended up going back in the in like early twenties. Um, my dad had a family business in Kansas with his father, so he couldn't just move out like we did. So he would come out for a month. Uh, he would come out every other month and stay three weeks and then go back and forth and back and forth. And it's a miracle. My parents are still together this day, despite that. Um, you know, it, it's really been a crazy journey when I think about it from my parents' side as I'm 33 now as an adult, um, being like, wow, that's incredible that they were able to manage a relationship, let alone while we were managing this business. And we had, we were just falling forward. That That's probably the best way of putting it. But um, there were certainly points where you came across certain auditions or certain characters and you're like, 
you know, do I want to spend, if I book this show, do I want to spend seven years doing this, you know? And, and if, if that is a miracle, you know, for a show to go seven years, but is that really what I want to, is this the type of character I want to play? I have some friends and mutual friends who were kind of, uh, you know, playing, uh, uh, playing some progressive type characters 15 years ago on TV. And then, you know, it's a smash hit and you're making out with guys every day on set and you're like, wow, this has become my reality. Um, and, and it's a challenge, right? You, you want to book a great role, but as you start moving through your career, you're like, wait, is this something that I personally want to do every day and not just be for, for work? Um, so meaning like, and, and I'm going to harp on that exact example, yeah, probably, but do. like, but it's that where like, you're, you're looking at the, because I remember that. I remember when you're suddenly faced with this decision as an actor when you're young where you're like, oh, okay, so if I get this call back or this producer call or if I go to network test for this, we sign all these contracts, this is potentially signing up to play this role in this show for the next seven years of my life, which at that age feels like for forever. I mean, that's just mm -hmm. like – that's it's going to be the rest mm -hmm. of your adulthood into your – you know, rest of your childhood into your early adulthood. And if it – and if the character runs up against – you know, um, yeah, something you're like, I don't know if I want to do that. Then that there, I imagine it, you know, I remember it affects my motivation in particular, good or bad, you know, like there were parts mm -hmm. where I was like, oh yeah, I definitely want to play this for the rest of my life. Or others where I was like, I, I don't think so. I don't, I don't, I don't think I, mm -hmm. I have this in me. So, but for you, was there a part then where they were like, you're a gay character and you're like, okay. And you're a young guy and you're going, I don't know if I can do this for the next seven years of my life walk us through that a little bit. Like, what is that? How does that go down? How do conversations with your parents or managers, like how does that whole thing play itself out? So at the time when I was uh, in a position for something like that, I did a pilot for ABC. Um, it was called uh, Sea of Fire. Um, it was, uh, what's her name? Jenna. She was, um, uh, she came up in the Chandra Rhymes writing camp. So it was this real soapy, edgy, prime time, 7 p.m., kind of inspired by the edginess of Desperate Housewives on steroids. And the character I was playing was like a high school uh, baseball player whose girlfriend goes missing in the pilot. And it's kind of like a, a murder mystery show, but everybody's got skeletons in their closet. Well, my character was a star baseball player who also had an undercover opioid addiction. And I was hooking up with my girlfriend's brother in order to get his drugs for me. Uh -huh. So I was like, wow, I could potentially be playing a drug addict who's, who's hooking up with my girlfriend's brother for drugs for seven years. Like, is that the type of role I want to play? You know? And at certain points in your life, maybe you're like, yeah, that's awesome. That's great. At 21, 22, after 12, 14 years in the business, I was like, Hmm, that's, that's a lot. That's a but lot you did it. But you did, did do the it. Pilot, you said, yeah, yeah. Did the pilot, so you did didn't it. get picked up, so the decision was made for me. <laughs> yeah, it's made for you anyway. But but I then I gotta imagine like walk somebody who's never has no experience with making that kind of decision, especially that age. Like, you know what 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 do you weigh out to say yes or no to? Like, you know what becomes your your focus on that? Is it just that it's great writing, it's a network show, and it's money, and it's some possible security? And there's it seems like a multifaceted, really interesting character. So you're willing to just kind of jump in, um, you know. Yeah. Yeah, is that really? Yeah. That, that's what I it mean. Comes it down was to, right? it was an opportunity to play an edgier character than I've really had an opportunity to do. Um, I'll use my. Uh, um, it's like almost you should have a guest on your show, but Sean Pyfrom can talk to you a lot about you know being uh, on a, a hit TV show and a character goes in so many different directions and then yeah. you're along for the ride for seven years and hundred episodes. Yeah, um, so I mean, I, I and they, I, they don't I, consult I, you on that. It's not like they're yeah. going to Sean, no. for example, or to you yeah. and saying, "What do you think about this?" They're which just, they yeah, really should. They, they, which, yes. which when you think about yeah. it, they really should. You know, because like yeah. I remember, I, the the only show I was a series regular on when I was a kid was uh we only did like 13 episodes of but by episode four i was like crying about how much i was masturbating you know yeah and when i did this i remember showing up and I, we read the table read and i was sort of read i just read it like that evening before and i was petrified i was like i'd never even mentioned like if i like like the barrier in my normal life between me and talking about masturbation was so thick you know it's like my nobody in my house it was like holy shit that the fact they were asking me to go out in front of this whole cast of adults and i and as i'm getting emotional about my 
my inability to stop masturbating, the room full of adults are hysterically laughing. They're like, ah, ha, ha, ha. And I was fucking mortified. I was like, that was it. And, and nobody, you don't know that. It, it, like, so my audition for that is not that, you know? Yeah. yeah there's yeah. no masturbation speak. Sorry, mm -hmm. go ahead, AJ. Well, it's just, it's so normalized. Nobody's saying like, okay, let's take a moment. Are you comfortable saying these words? You know, is there anything that you're like Hey, to we're talk thinking through? about writing this type of storyline for your character. It's t touchy. No. I, I, I wonder how things are these days, but yeah, definitely at that point. It's so, different it, at 22, Kevin, when you're talking about the, the role that you did, but this happens at 14, happens at mm -hmm. 12. It, it, there's mm -hmm. no reason why it couldn't have been the case when you were much younger that you booked that, that role. Exactly. So, so I get a question over your whole career. And my guess is, and just the way you hold yourself too, you, you, I'm, you, you saw everything, you know, it's a, you, you probably saw every facet of what a young performer could see in the entertainment industry and experienced a, a majority. So walk us through, give me a couple of like the best highlights for you. Like the, obviously Bonnie Hunts was really influential on you. What, what are some of the other really great influences? And then walk us through some of the other really big challenges you felt. Let, let's do some of the <clears throat> highlights first. Influences. Uh, I did the pilot episode of a mini series called Taken. Uh, Spielberg produced it. Um, and I got to work with Toby Hooper, director of Chainsaw Massacre, oh, yeah. the original, um, Anton Yelchin, you know, RIP. Um, like, that was a really special project. I was in Vancouver at the time. Uh, that's when the plane smashed in the World Trade Center, too. So oh, I was in the Georgia Suites. My mom woke me up and was like, hey, there's a plane that crashed into the World Trade Center. I'm like, mom, it's a movie. You should probably turn it off. And she's like, no. Um, so Taken really stuck with me for a multitude of reasons. Um, butterfly effect was like being a part of a it like it was like sitting at the grown-up table when you were way too young and <laughs> they were so happy to have you there um mm. that was incredible it was a uh, 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 director writer duo friends um ashton kutcher put up some of his own money for it to to finance the film it was like way outside of his scope at the time um that felt like uh being away at the coolest summer camp ever the cheaper films um you know are as much a part of my childhood as so many different people who still come up and talk about the movie to this day to me um that's really special and then this yeah because that's followed you uh, correct me if i'm wrong i feel like a year ago i saw on your yeah. instagram or something you guys had like recreated all the actors came together to recreate like one yeah. of the big iconic scenes from it you yeah. know, and it seemed like everybody jumped on board. There was no loose ends. There was nobody that was like almost, oh, no, guys. almost, oh, almost really. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah, we so almost who was the holdout? Uh, Tom Welling was the holdout. Mr. Tom. Uh, oh, we yeah. couldn't get Steve and one of the girls, Liliana. But other than that, we had everybody. We had everybody. Um, yes. But that that was crazy. That that video was nuts. It it took my like YouTube channel from fifty thousand subscribers to half a million. Like it went bananas over it that really one did. video over Just, that one video like it, so it, it has 180 million views on it it's nuts that's so crazy. and that's just on youtube it's on tiktok allison released it did another 150 million it was nuts it was do people do do you did now outside of just the internet world or something is that always followed you around like do you still go get a cup of coffee and they're like oh my god are you the guy from like do is that still follow you everywhere or, or what is that like for you not now? not so much just because i physically have changed so much but yeah. because of where i'm at in the community i'm in like a lot of people are like hey you're you know oh you're that hey, guy gotcha. hey, yeah, hey, yeah. hey hey kevin you know by the way what's going on on the tv station you know yeah yeah um it's because it's just been a, a fun way to you know take that story and add to it um so That's those are great. those I are mean, it the, the, those were the, the highlights. For those sure. are the highlights. Did and you this, ever meet this one? This one. This I did a, a one. It was Cartoon Network's first first live action series. It was uh, Unnatural History. Mike Werb wrote it. For, he wrote The Mask and Face Off and uh, some really incredible stuff. Two I classics. Was doing, yeah, yeah. Right. Right. And uh, so I was doing parkour and Shaolin Kung Fu and stunts every week. It was the hardest I've ever worked in my entire life. Um, six months in Toronto. Thirteen episodes straight. No break. Um, dieting the whole time. It was it was hard, you know. But wow. I saw how old were you? I was twenty two. Wow. Um, twenty two. Uh, learned what I was capable of on that one for sure. And and fortunately, even you know, with all the different projects, I only really had one, uh, one project that wasn't that fun. And it's because the director was such a douche. 
Um, and this is like a big guy. This is, I don't, I don't even care now to say it. it's Don Belisario from the Jag stuff. Um, he's the creator of all oh, the yeah. shows and he was just really rude. And he sat in his chair and barked orders the whole time. And I remember being on that set being like, this is the, not the type of leadership I would ever want on set, let alone in as a father, as, as a business owner, I was like, his son, it, yeah. his son, he got his son to play one of the other characters in this cold opening. It's literally the, the pilot for Jagged CIS. And he's like barking at his son the whole time. And, and his son didn't want to be there. And I, I, you know, I earned, I earned the role, right. I booked it and, and auditioned, earned it, got there. And I'm like, this is so, this is sad, you yeah. know? So hmm. there was one, one project in all of them that I was just like, man, nah, I don't want to work with this guy ever again. Yeah. I gotta say, it's it amazing. Like your, that... your career is. Well, go ahead, Chris. No, no, shoot. Just your your career is filled with so many successes. It seems just like a string of of success and um, going from one job to the next. Were there ever lulls in there that got difficult, not knowing where your next job was going to come from, or like, did I make the right choice, or it, did any of that stuff spring up? Yeah, um, there was a very odd psychologically it was a bit difficult too there was an odd transition when i was uh about 17 18 years old i was like a late bloomer and i also just didn't know what i was putting in my body and how to get it out i was like a, i was a chubby kid in all the movies growing up right but when i was 17 i was like i'm ready to get my health in order i'm ready to not be exhausted when i go up a flight of stairs and when I was 17, I lost like 50 pounds of fat. Wow. Um, and then I finally hit like a late growth spurt and I grew like four inches. And all of a sudden, the roles I used to go for the you know chubby best friend, the, the, the comedic relief, now I'm getting thrust into auditions for, for leading men. And it was such an odd shift in perspective for me too, because it wasn't just in my professional life, it was in my, you know, my, my personal life. Like I was the best friend of all the cute girls we grew up with and all the young actresses. And meanwhile, I'm just like, man, I really like you, you know, but I wasn't in a position to be able to like to, to execute on anything cut to, I take better care of myself. I grow up a little bit. I shed some weight and now I'm getting the attention that I was seeking as a younger kid, even romantically. So the, the transition in the, in the industry, which was difficult is all these casting directors that I spent the last decade auditioning with knew me as the chubby boy. Hmm. And now my agents one year later is like, Hey, you need to bring him in for this leading man role. They're like, this is Kevin. We know Kevin, you don't it, look, I'm sure he's doing better. Cool. And it took a year. I didn't work for a year after I lost all that weight until I had to reestablish myself for, for kind of leading man roles and wow. for, for, uh, in knock on wood and counting all my blessings the entire time. Cause this, the business is ruthless. Um, that was really difficult to go from working and this being not only your, your a part of your identity, but your income and then not working because you did something good for your health. Yeah. Uh, and <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's really messy. You know, it, it's interesting because I, my middle brother, Eric, mm -hmm. also he like, that was his niche as he was the chubby kid and mm -hmm. he'd walk in and he had this big mop haircut and he was like the chubby kid. And that's everything he ever did was like, like I think his his claim to fame was being in the Adventures of Joe Dirt, this comedy mm -hmm. movie, mm -hmm. and he's just a kid in class. Every time they cut to him, he's like ho ho ho, and he's like eating Oreos. That's it. It's like his. And they love job. they love to make the fat kid eat. Love love, love to make him eat. Love to just love watch it. him sit there and eat and stuff and giggle yeah. or look scared. You know, it's yeah. like that's all. That's all I did. And you know, it really I always felt like just being a couple years older than him. I always saw it took a big toll on him. It took him especially personally. You know, so he was going to school after having spent all his time where people are like giving him weird validation for being goofy and chubby. And, you know, and it was a big reason I think he receded from it, that he really unplugged and didn't like it. He didn't like doing that. At one point, <laughs> my mother and his manager at one point went so far as to, they're like, all right, we're going to reinvent him as the real chubby kid, but they want chubby kids who are redheads with freckles. And so they like dyed his hair and put fake freckles on his face and redid headshots oh, for man. him. And we have these, and there was an, an a, a good three, four years of Eric's life where if like my brother Sean and I brought this to the table, it fucked him up. He was like violently reactive to these headshots. It was not okay that that happened to him. And so it's really, I, I would love to get your take on where that, 
not only does it become challenging when you decide, you know what, I'm going to shed some weight, you know, because you, it does lead to you playing a role where you're doing parkour and you're like the lead guy. And so you're like, cool. So it works out in some degree, but prior to that transition, you know, what is that like where you're, you're pegged as that guy and that's where you're going in and it's where you're su succeeding, where you're getting your, your bread and butter is from that, you know, does that dawn on you? Does that hit you? Is it something to go through or, or what is that like? Um, Fortunately, though I was physically um, in lesser shape than I am now, um, I had a really good support system. So, it to me, it was my value wasn't ever wound, what wasn't wrapped up in my physicality. Mm -hmm. I think that experience just, if anything, it it made me take everything even less personally, because frankly, mm -hmm. we're constantly. Uh, being exposed to all different new people, names, advertising, information, our short and our long-term memories constantly taxed. Uh, people just identify initially based on what people look like. You know, it's not, it's not personal if you're like, hey, remember in that group of people, there was that fat guy or there was that white guy or there's that black guy or the black girl. Like initially people just pick up on surface level detail to be able to recall an instance. And, and, and I think when I made that transition from a, a chubby kid to more of a leading man, I took way less offense of being people being like, Oh, it's just the fat guy. Cause I'll catch myself doing it now. It'd be like, I like, do at the restaurant. There was the guy who was talking to was next to the heavier guy. And, and I'm like, Oh my gosh, you know, it, yeah. it literally isn't always personal and it can feel that way a bit when you're on set and people want to put, make you be the chubby kid and give you a donut in every scene. Or I did this, uh, UPN show called like the mullets. And I wasn't fat enough. So they wanted to put a fat suit on me. And yeah. meanwhile, I had already like started making this transition in my mind. Like I'm going to take better care of myself. Like I straight up refused. I'm like, no, I'm not hmm. doing it. Hmm. Sorry. And how does that go down? Do they go? They were upset. Dude, you got yeah, they're upset. They're yeah. upset. I don't blame them. You know, I'd be upset yeah. too, because once again, the director's not personally saying like, I'm a, you know, not judging me personally as a bad person. He's saying like, Hey, it would be funnier if you were actually like really fat, but were really mobile, you know, like yeah. Chris Farley. Um, so it was an interesting shift. Um, yeah. And, and well, and, you and, and, and was that I mean, your was that your transition, Kevin, from child actor to adult actor? Did that correspond with that physical shift, or did that come later when you got a bit older? I, I think so, but I've always played younger. I mean, I, and I still, you know, people still think I'm younger than I am now, but I always played younger. Um, so I, I think for me, and even the, la the last movie I did, it was uh, before I came out to Maryland, uh, Warner Brothers film with John Voight. I was playing a, wrestl a wrestler in high school. I was 29. 28. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, so still, I, yeah. I, but I was on a soap opera for five years and I was, you know, had a girlfriend and was a dynasty character and it was, wasn't in high school, but I wasn't in college. So yeah. I, I don't know, you know, you know I think the saying, transition, the transition you, was more just in the flexibility of being a leading man versus a character actor. Yeah. Maybe. Well, you're also a handsome dude, which lends a hand to that, you know, because there's, there's a lot of people that change their, you know, I mean, the the story of former kid actor, you know, who turns like bodybuilder is yeah. fairly consistent too. you know, mm -hmm. for men mm -hmm. and women, you know, whatever version yeah. of that is, you know, for somebody is really consistent because shedding that view that's given to you, you know, just mm -hmm. based on your appearance, appearance happens one way or another, you know, yeah. it just does, you know, sometimes you'll see, you know, whether it's Miley Cyrus becoming like a rock star madonna fuck you i'm gonna like you know moon you and flick you off at the same time uh to shed this sort of disney girl status like what whatever it is it, it happens there's a rejection in some way of, uh, of of what happens but you seem to have done that even as it was happening and afterwards and, and post really well you seem to have done that because you say like a very strong support system that you had a strong family that was there supporting you that didn't i imagine didn't allow you to slip into a self-deprecating place or a judgmental place about yourself that kept you up and that also, you know, you have had an intelligent mind enough to figure that out, to figure out like, oh, I shouldn't take this personal. This is not someone making fun of me. This is someone just by my appearance. It's the character. You know? it's the yeah, character. it's the character. And so it, 
Pat, outside of that though, is there like a natural, like when you look back at that and knowing yourself now, like, you know, is there a part though, where you, I don't know, where like that crossed a line and that was too much to handle? Or was there ever a time where you were like, man, that's fucked up or that it really did affect you or stuck with you? Or, or is it, it, you really were able to just maintain that and always have? Yeah, I, it, I think I was okay. You know, yeah. I think I was really okay. It was, uh, fortunately I was able to separate the character from the person. Um, and it doesn't hurt that I was, I, you know, I was fortunate to work a lot, you know, like it helps a lot when you're working, you know, and, yeah. and, and in order to survive as an artist, you have to, and even like, I'm sure as we've all grown up in, in, um, our, our approach to audition rooms, I'm sure have evolved throughout the years. Um, you know, I remember even my approach to my auditions is kind of critical turning point of being like, okay, I've been doing this for 15 years. Um, uh, I feel like I'm like, a, uh, I feel like I learned acting on set with actors. It wasn't some formal pro I didn't go to film school for it and backwards engineer. I just was, boom, I was there. Um, as I got older though, in different roles and challenges, it was like, do I reinvest in this serious Brando method actor approach to my craft or do i do what feels more authentic to me which is to have fun and keep it playful and realize that the success is about doing your best for you leaving the room and never thinking about it again like yeah. just get in this cycle of of doing the best you can and letting letting you know the results the happen. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Just dude, you're like, that, you, that ended up, that ended up being my approach as I got older. I was just like, I, I can relate to that in a lot of, in a lot of ways. It's the, it's the, uh, obsessive mind of the actor trying to take control of the things that you can take control over and trying to troubleshoot a career that's maybe gone off the rails a little bit. This I'm talking about my own experience. And so trying to handle some of those things like doubling down on a certain acting technique and trying to to take on some things that may improve um, the success rate and some other stuff going on. What, but there's um, also, I mean, but Kevin's also making this point about, you know, like Kevin, you, you're like a vet by the time you're, you're 15 or 16. It's like, you're, yeah, you're, I felt you're, like it. <laughs> yeah. I would say like, you, you know, there's no, no part of this feels at any point. Like you, like you were like, Oh, I'm a trained vet. I'm, I'm more experienced than a majority of the people I'm sitting around with on a set at this point. So it also, you know, by the time you're 22, that, that weirdly you still have that maturity in order to be able to make that kind of decision. Cause I didn't make that decision i made the brando decision i was like oh i've been acting my whole life but i have no idea what the fuck i'm doing so now i'm gonna double down and do this other uh super intensive yeah. suddenly i'm gonna study things and, and and chop away at everything i ever did you know and really mess myself mm -hmm. up quite honestly and just like try to reinvent the wheel yeah. in some in some poor way instead yeah. of what i eventually yeah. came to which was the decision you made which is like oh i need to have fun i need to be able to enjoy this i need for this to be a process where i just trust myself and show up and let go of the results and not try to grapple with anything i think there was a bigger point you're going to make aj Can sorry well yeah and i wanted to ask you something else kevin which is just looking at your resume you've worked consistently from the very beginning and it seems to me now i know you live in maryland that you have you made some type of conscious decision it seems like to audition less or to make acting less of your focus what was the inspiration for wherever you're at now what was the inspiration point to do that it does not sound to me and per perhaps i'm wrong but i want to hear your story it does not sound to me that hollywood said no to you it seems like you decided to make some life-changing decisions hmm. i think it's a good observation uh uh the business has changed so much man um in so many ways uh one of your questions you had on here is where you spend your coogan account on when i turned 18 i uh i think i had ninety thousand in my coogan account and i invested thirty thousand into a dance instructional video that i wrote and produced and directed with allison stoner um I took 30, she took 30 and my mom and our, my, my dad and her mom put in 30, raised a hundred thousand dollars to make our DVD. Uh, I literally have it here. Look at this. Allison Stoner Sick. project, right? Wow. And we authored the DVD. We made it. Um, it. It was like literally a dance instructional video for kids. I sold it to stars anchor Bay at the time, went through the whole distribution process. I learned, I learned how content is monetized and 
it's the first time I hired my own location cinematographer. I was using a red one camera before there was a, a, a firmware to, to cut it in final cut. I learned in editing systems. Then like I paid for film school at 18 by producing my own project. And it was, I had a buddy who was in New York film Academy who grew up as an actor at the same time. And they were having them cut 16 millimeter film and glue it together and run it through a projector. And I'm like, this ain't the business, you know? Um, so I was like, whoa, the business is changing. My skill sets have to change. So that's how I not only transitioned from actor and started writing and producing and I'm doing a lot of different stuff over the years. But uh, the first flag for me was 08 when the market crashed globally. Um, I wrote Cheaper by the Dozen 3, a draft for it. And I wanted to get it made because my logic brain of production and distribution of money is like, oh, they're going to recreate franchise films time and time again. They're not going to take risk on, on new IP. Uh, this make, it made a ton of money. They should do a third one. Let's finish it. I tried to get it made and it was no, no, no from Fox. This is Fox. Um, cut to our video goes viral last year. Disney plus buys uh, the catalog of 20th century. They're remaking the film, all diverse cast uh uh adopts a child none of the original characters and after you know quarter billion views of marketing thought that was pretty disingenuous to not reach out to any of us and be like hey you know there was something magical here let's see if we can capture it again so oh eight uh market changed i wasn't uh impressed at the risk that they were taking on content Content was being created by YouTubers, by influencers. The, the value of media started going down because it was being consumed so much and so much more became available. Uh, 2016, huge turning point for me in the industry. Um, uh, election year, um, I watched Hollywood basically say, if you don't think or act like us, you're a bigot or close-minded or dangerous or every other a uh, demoralizing title you could give to a human being who thinks differently than you. I grew up in Kansas. Like I have like hard, strong conservative background, but I grew up in a super liberal industry. I'm literally a balance of both. And I watched so many coastal opinions degrade the rest of the United States. And what happened? People stopped going to movie theaters. They, 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 they cut their cable box, right? And then, so 2016, I was like, ooh, the market's shifting, the business is shifting. Um, I don't know if this will be an evergreen industry like I thought growing up. I've always had an interest in business. Um, I've done a lot of different businesses in my life. Um, I've always been interested in, in community building and government. So uh, 2018, I started putting my resume out um, in DC, in the DC area, uh, to start working with different policy groups from a digital marketing communications broadcasting standpoint, because I've done enough content creation, I could swing it. Um, one of my meetings was with uh, the county government in Maryland to build out a government access TV station. So it's, you know, commissioner meetings and planning commission, school board and PSAs and educational content. Like this is your government and this is what it does. Um, I had an opportunity to, to take a leap of faith and I did it, uh, in 2019 and I got out here and I've, uh, built a broadcast division. I've got four producers. I'm finishing building a, a studio. We got a soundstage approved 5,000 square feet. We're going to be a regional draw for, for both community and private industry. Uh, just being able to work with leadership and government and and have them start considering tax dollars as infrastructure for business development within a community and then seeing that come to fruition with the broadcast station the future soundstage it's like whoa there's growth happening here in content creation in storytelling and it's not in hollywood um and then corona hit right mm -hmm. and then corona hit and what did Corona really do from my standpoint is it really hurt movie theaters more than anything, right? Movie theaters were, I don't, I don't mean to say that more than anything, specifically in the industry. Movie theaters are first dollar gross return on an investment, right? If you make a feature film, you're looking for that 13 to $20 movie ticket because that's what the studio gets and that's your first ROI. 
And then you go through your various sales cycles from streaming down to physical media, et cetera, TV buyouts, the whole lifeline of a piece of content. When the market, when the, when Corona hit, people were scared to go to movie theaters, movie theaters, um, probably won't come back to like they were ever before. And when I say probably, I mean, it would be really silly for anybody to think movie theaters aren't going to evolve. So has this then given comes, a boost okay, then to what, to what you were doing? Did that suddenly create more of an avenue for what you've been setting up? Not uh, so government side. Yeah. Uh, but just in the business, and this is what I think is so fascinating about entertainment now. Um, if you know that the movie theater is not going to go back to what it was and the movie theater hasn't evolved since an outdoor theater came indoors, what is the next movie theater? What is the next community? What is the next physically collective experience to take in audiovisual content? And tell us. I've been, uh, I, I can't tell you. I've been working I know, on you know, it. I was like, you got the answer. And you're, I can I've been see working you. On you're it. like, I got yeah. it, guys. It's a it's a billion dollar idea and I got it. I'm going to hoard it until I see it to fruition. No, can we're going to we're gonna, we're gonna bring it to reality for sure. That's awesome. I, I will say it is very wild that polarizing politics seem to play a part in you separating from this long-standing career you had built that's yeah. wild you the other half thing the audience man half the audience well said, well also but but you personally which is you go yeah. you know i'm from wichita because i have a friend of mine who's a filmmaker and he's his family's from ohio he's a cons very conservative guy mm -hmm. and it's given him a lot of trouble being a part of Hollywood as he endeavors to do something that he feels is outside of politics, you know, mm -hmm. and it's a really, it's a become a very, I watch him, you know, really struggle with this thing. And so it's interesting to have, you know, to have someone who'd been a part of this very successfully as a, as their, their whole childhood. Uh, and then that become one of, uh, you know, the reasons is not the main reason to sort of, to move in a different direction. So that's wild important to point out. Also though, here's the thing. I'm so glad you're not just an actor. Like as you yeah. were talking about halfway through, I was like, fuck, I'm such an actor, bro. I was like, <laughs> I was, I was like you like got like after your like 19th sentence that was real long mm -hmm. and smart. And I was like, Oh, I'm such a fucking actor, bro. Just give me some sides. I'll memorize this, this monologue. This, you we know, but like, I know, but but the truth is, is it is so nice. It, it, it what I'm trying to highlight there, if anyway, is like your brain has obviously always been um, super capable, and your ability to kind of you know your brain's too good to just be memorizing some lines and rolling the dice to see if you get on another set. So That's it's very so nice. sweet, Chris. No, but it's true. But it, it, it really is. No, no, no. But it's so it's so it, it makes absolute sense as to why your life has continued to unfold the way it does. And I'm so glad you've done that and haven't hindered yourself by means of trapping yourself as a former kid actor and like and like sticking to a plan that maybe existed at 12, you know, because that is the trap. That is the big yeah. trap for former kid actors. So it's so nice that like your life has not revolved around. You're not a guy sitting in Hollywood still. That's like, I wrote a cheaper by the dozen three script and nobody's doing it. So fuck you guys. And just like doing nothing else with your life, you know, mm -hmm. you, you, your life is unfolded in such a nice big way. And it's so nice to see. And, um, and I, I just think about, I think I thought about it as you were speaking too. I thought there was one question we didn't, I didn't really get to touch on, which is you see, you know, I relate to you so much in, in the way you got into the business, the way you ingrained yourself in the business. Like I, you know, my parents and I were choosy, but not like we, we, if it felt cool, we did it, you know, and it was all kinds of stuff. We did the weird print jobs for local malls and we went out to New York and did all kinds of weird regional theater. And, you know, I did videos for hospitals and, you know, to walk kids through surgery. Like we did all kinds of shit. So for you doing all that, what are, what are the things you did that no one has any idea about would never remember you from, or was that was just so weird? Like something when you think back, you're like, did I do that? Was there just some weird gig or audition process even? Like just, did you end up on like a, a mall in Mexico city at some point <laughs> singing a song? You know, it's like, was there something so weird that you, that, that your, your, your life as a kid actor took you to? Uh, not so crazy weird. Uh, I did have a print, uh, uh, you remember studio city yogurt on Laurel Canyon and Ventura? Yeah. This would be the software. But I had literally had a uh, an image that I took in New York that was on the side of their ice cream machine up until 
they got rid of that. <laughs> so I would go in years later and see my, I was like five years old, see a print job I did on the side of the soft serve, you know, yogurt shop in, in, awesome. in the Valley. That's um, hilarious. That is really so, Kevin. Yeah. So um, yeah, go ahead, AJ. Yeah. No, I was just going to ask, we usually end with two questions, one of which you answered, and it's one of my favorite answers given to what you Ever. spent your Coogan account money on. Yeah. I love that. That's so I cool. want to see this Allison um, Stoner video. I think it's so, so, so funny. What a and genius amazing. idea. You did that. Too. Yeah, I what mean, a great thing. That's what I mean. Yeah. I was like, you're destined to not just be an actor. Like, you took your Coogan account money and you put up, <laughs> you, you made a $100,000 thing that you directed, wrote, and produced, and with somebody else just really talented. Like, that's, that's fucking crazy, man. Like, we, you know, here we're like the best answers we get is i was like i went to a lot of clubs bro <laughs> you know, it's like there's just there's not, you <laughs> know, that too. Yeah, yeah yeah well there we go uh, so but, but anyway, chris what's yeah. our other what's our other question our other last question is is would you let your kids do it uh wow um i think i think we'd uh i, I don't know i don't know we'll have to see how the market shifts and changes there's <laughs> there's so many other there's so many other things i've been i've been like thinking about as we've been talking like other motivating factors of why i said yes to maryland and such i know you keep it to 45 so i think yeah. you gotta Wait, you gotta I, button it the I, way you want to button it well i i have the question i think really especially for you in particular as i really grasped you know what your professional life was like and personal life you know from what you told us is you know would you ever be willing to put yourself in a position like your parents put themselves in would you ever be willing to commit some move or some like take the endeavor into that real professional place with your children if they really wanted to do it maybe maybe i mean i think it's a it's not a yes or a no just because i, I my brothers and I were the momentum and why we wanted to do it. My parents were never uh, guy leading us towards anything. Um, and, you know, my older brother was the first to get out at 18 because he was like, I don't think this is a lifestyle I feel very comfortable with moving forward. He went to college, got law degrees and works for a, a defense contractor in D.C. My little brother, um, you know, was having a lot of fun and booked Big Time Rush and it changed his whole life. And toured the world and and multiple albums and now they're getting back together and making new music and going on tour so it's a uh, it's been an, a wonderful journey despite the challenges and some really odd uh things that can pop up along the way um you know we didn't really touch on it but another another motivating factor why i said peace out was like when the the uh weinstein stuff hit and when um uh, the Jeffrey Epstein stuff came out. One of my old representatives were like, you know, number five or six taken down in the Me Too stuff. And I remember going on a hike in Runyon Canyon when he was past that phase and whatever the hell happened behind the scenes and he pretty much lost his career and he was just seeking moral support. And I remember going on a hike in Runyon and um, being like, you know, like, cause I've always, I've been, writing led me to research. I research everything, right? Um, I was like, you know, that Epstein guy, he's a bad dude. And, you know, like they have like tunnels underneath there and they're into some really odd stuff. And this girl, Jocelyn Maxwell, you know, she's a sub pilot too, like submarines. And, you know, they do some weird stuff there. And he's like, oh, do you really believe that? You really believe that? Uh, I'm like, yeah, I, I do because I've also seen the underbelly at DC and it's pretty, pretty gross too. Um, cut to when the flight logs come out, he's on them. So not your only, rep, your ex yeah, rep, my old rep. Was so you're old. It was an, I, I think I might know who this is. Maybe, I, I, maybe there's more you, than one. You, rep. You, I, yeah. And I don't know. I only know this now third hand. I forgot his name. So I don't know if you care to say, I wouldn't not. blast him. I wouldn't blast yeah. anyway, but it was but, a like, but it, if, if I'm wrong, it was an agent that represented child actors, predominantly male child actors, young mm -hmm. male child actors. And he was, uh, as far as I knew, fired he was, and yeah, everyone. fired. And it was known for a long time that he had had inappropriate relationships with young male actors that he represented and friends of theirs and stuff like that. And I knew two stories. I knew one story I heard through the grapevine of someone who had experienced uh, the disgusting, tragic side of that. And I had somebody else that was like, no, they were my rep. I never had any of that experience at all. Mm -hmm. Although I did hear stuff, you know, yeah. although it's, it wasn't like, you know, yeah. I, I, I wasn't was, blindsided. I was, I was fortunate, um, but I thought it was 
crazy later on when I learned like, wow, I was getting gaslit in real time being like, you don't believe anything weird happens there and cut to you on the flight logs like, whoa, dude. And so uh, that's and, and Wayne, correct me when I was when you were telling your story. So he gets fired and then he reaches out to you and you guys end up on a hike together. Or yeah, is this, this is like after this is after I moved out to Maryland. Right. So I'd come back in town and it was like, hey, I'm just like I'm, I'm a changed person. And you know, I'm making different choices. And if you're comfortable, like I'd really like to just pick your brain on what's going on in the world. And you know, I've, I've kind of always been a communicator in my community. Um, so I'm, I'm always open, but at the time I didn't realize the extent of all of this messiness and, um, Holy shit. you know, has and, he and, ever hit you up since or, or no, no that's, that was just no. that. And how does no. that feel? I mean, how do your parents feel like, how does that feel that you guys had that close of, uh, did that per that person must have repped you for a long time if if you guys couple kept in years. contact couple, couple years. years yeah for sure um i think my my whole family is very we're very fortunate to have avoided the real underbelly of the industry and and you know this is one guy everyone knows harvey weinstein but there's even stuff with like you know keith rainier and the nexium sex cult stuff that came out like you Allison Mack from Smallville was a recruiter, you know, and yeah. branding women and creating this really, it, it, it's odd. DC politics in Hollywood, they're yeah. very interconnected. And sex cults. Yeah. They're all, no, it really they're, they're is wildly like wildly interconnected. And yeah. um, you have to be careful, man. You really yeah. do. Well, I'm okay. really glad you came out so unscathed and not just unscathed, like blossomed into a real, um, a real force, man. It's uh, I think it's really awesome what you're doing. And I, I just, it makes me inside sort of chuckle at like the, you break the mold of former kid actor, Kevin, like you just break it, you shatter it to pieces because you know, the former kid actor as it's presented as someone who's a, who's a mugshot or who is really struggling, you know, or who's the punchline you know, to, to a joke that just, that, that, that just exists. And so for you to have, you know, live this sophisticated life and to have put together so much, um, since your time for your older brother to be a defense contract lawyer for your other brother to have toured the world with music. It's like, you know, you guys, um, uh, I, your strong foundation with parents and your strong set of who you guys are, uh, I think shows that there's a version of being a kid actor that is not tragic, that is really wonderful and can be a blessing and can really set a strong foundation for people as they grow in their lives. And, and, and that there's no set in stone way of how that goes. I mean, nobody, I could have never predicted that that's the case being in, in rooms with you guys, my whole childhood, you know, mm -hmm. um, and auditioning. It's like, that was not, I would have never guessed. I don't think any of you guys would have guessed. I don't think any agent or director you worked with would have guessed it. So it's, it's really spectacular. I don't know if you ever, if you ever dwell on it or ever reflect on it, but from the outside in it, it's, you know, looking at it, it is, it's really amazing. And I'm so happy you shared part of that with us today. So um, yeah, I'm really grateful. Thanks so much, you. Kevin. Yeah. I appreciate um, it. Yeah, man. Is there anything to, and is there any facet of your musings on former kid actors that you, that you feel like we, we didn't get to, is there something that, um, you know, when you think about your time with your brothers, you know, being kid actors, is there some, some, some facet of that, 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 that touches your, that, that opened up during this conversation that you want to share about? Um, I think, I think maybe for <clears throat> like a kind of closing thought for me and, and for, for all of us, like we have such an incredible community of talented people um and that talent and we talked a little bit before that talent transcends the entertainment industry like being able to pick up on take direction pick up on detail think ahead um constantly move forward like those are all communication um, emotional intelligence those are skill sets that are applicable to so many different um industries in the world and and any artist needs to I think when artists are brought up and even in, in the business in ways too, we're always encouraged to like silo our thought processes. You're the artist, be the artist. That shit. No, be whatever is authentic to you and evolve with your environment. Like if 
if LA is feeling stagnant and you are, you're passionate for, for being a performer, like Georgia has been popping off Louisiana after Katrina blossomed, the Carolinas have opportunity. Like uh, Austin's going to have a huge film scene now. Like, like don't be afraid, don't be afraid to be a bigger fish in a smaller pond and see what happens from there. So I have so many artist friends that I, I want to, I wanted to encourage them to keep evolving with the times and, and recognize the signs and know that your, your talent is applicable to so many, so many people be so lucky to have some of the talented people in our community, um, you know, in their, in their community. And that's, that's what happened when I came here. It was just like open arms and we would love to hear your thoughts on, on everything from, you know, setting up an AV room in a, in a courthouse to, um, an approach to an outreach plan. Like there's so many ways that, that our skill sets as artists can be applied in, in, in the real world. And, and it's, a uh, it's encouraging when you look at it that way. Especially with a super sharp mind, like the one you have. So that's awesome, man. Um, Kevin, you're fucking dope, man. Uh, you're a great dude. Uh, your family's awesome. Uh, I'm so grateful you came on here. I'm so grateful you shared so much of it. Uh, and, uh, Thank you, man. Thank you for being part of the Coogan Chronicles podcast uh, and uh, wisely spent Coogan account money. Right, AJ? <laughs> Very wise. The first Very wise. Know that it, it exactly. actually made an investment. Well done. Yeah, you're, 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 you're the sage just so you know right now. If we did a little pie, if we did a little like uh, a little picture, we had everybody's headshots. You'd be at the top like like a, like a wizard. You'd yeah, have if we a had to rank them like best, best use of Coogan account funds versus. Yes, <laughs> you're at the top of the charts right there. Yeah. <laughs> So I, I I don't know if you know, but that's uh that's definitely that's definitely you. Well done. So thank you again, man. Thank you so much, Kevin. Thank you.